You know, um, Jesus said that we would be living in a time that would be like the days of Noah. Well, <clears throat> that is when God made a decision to destroy the earth. And when he did that, many, I won't say many, but the people that were righteous before God, Noah being the main one, Noah who lived such a godly life before God, actually it says he condemned the whole world. His life condemned the whole world. When Jesus was on the earth, his life condemned the hypocrite. So you see, it's not what we say, it's how we live. And it's always going to be impossible to please everybody for them to be able to see that you live that life, except you will be known as you are. You will be known that if people know you don't lie, you don't lie. I mean, I could remember something like 45 years ago, maybe 35. I can't remember exactly which because so many things have happened. I can remember uh, my husband telling a story to someone about me. And he was telling how our, our house was falling apart. And that was, oh, it was many houses ago. Anyway, he was telling about how the electrical part of the house, uh, I guess the box caught on fire. And he said, I was just ready to just run out of it, let it burn, and let the insurance company take over. He says, but then I stopped and I saw her. And I knew that I would never get away with that lie. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Because he didn't say that when it happened. He only said it afterwards when he was telling somebody the situation that that would have been his way of getting rid of that, what he called an albatross. And it was very difficult to live there. And when we sold it, we sold it as it is. And we did our best to never cheat anybody. We made sure we told them, well, this is wrong, that's wrong. And they still made their decision. So if they lied about it and said we didn't tell them, we didn't, well, you know, that's between them and God. Because I remember telling them, oh, don't, don't say it, don't say it. Because if you say it, I won't get my money to buy it. And so don't tell me, I don't want to know it. And we couldn't figure it out. So we, we even wrote it down, what was wrong with it. So <laughs> anyway, We'll go back to the days of Noah. Noah preached for a long time before anything happened. <clears throat> and no one would listen to him. No one would pay attention to him. No one heard him. And when the, when the day came for for the flood, for the rains, there were thousands of people, I think, screaming and crying to let them into the ark. And you see, God said it was too late. They had made their choice. I have seen God do this so many times. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But he says in Romans that you store up wrath uh, on the day of wrath. You get angry that God is going to come and deal with you. We're not, I'm not giving this message to a Christian because a Christian doesn't do that. And in the word many times, uh, uh, there are times, I won't say many times, but there are times where Paul said, you don't need to be told these things because nobody has to tell you about brotherly love because you know those things. There's certain things that you understand and you know. But he knew he had to say it 
for those who never heard it. And I, that's what God has me doing right now. You know, I was going to say, well, I guess I thought God says, no, don't you dare. I'm giving it to you. So that is how it goes. But anyway, just think of the years that they had to repent, to, to walk away, to turn away from their evil deeds, to stop what they were doing. And the earth was so saturated with evil. I had said before that it even affect, affected the creeping things. When the animals were called to the ark, no one was given, no one was given instruction on how to choose them. And he told them those animals, no matter what they were, if they crouched before him, and you know how a uh, animal would, uh, a dog or a cat or anybody would, would, any animal would crouch before you and, and submissively crawl to you. He said, those animals, you let them in. But the ones that stand up and defy you, you don't want them. I've said that before, that when you're picking out a baby puppy, you know, I've had a Doberman puppy in my hand about this size, newborn. Okay, but if you take that puppy and you put your two fingers around its neck uh, and you hold it down, you, you hold it down like this on its neck. And if it struggles or fights, you don't want that puppy because you'll have trouble training it because it's non-submissive. You see, a, a dog don't like being turned on their back. It has to do with dominance and control and everything the way they are made naturally. So if you put your two fingers, put them on their back and put your two fingers on, on what is the most vulnerable place to them naturally, and that is their throat. And they just lay there and let you, you're not going to have any trouble training that animal. I know I've trained many dogs. I've outlived oh, so many. And I remember having a, a Doberman that, oh, there was no dog like this Doberman. And she was like three or four months old when I got her. But God picked her out. And when she laid on my lap on the way home, she just laid and threw her, her head back, threw her, her arms out and her legs and just laid like that and slept the whole trip home. And that told me immediately that God was showing me that dog would never be any trouble, and she wasn't. She instinctively knew how to treat a human being. She instinctively, more than most people, knew how to respect your property. I didn't have to teach it to her. She knew how to respect. And, and, and I, they say some animals pick up the way you are. If you're fearful, they're fearful. If you're mean, they're mean. If you're destructive, they're destructive. If you're if you're peaceful, they're peaceful. If you have a lot of joy, they enjoy life with you. There's so much of your personality and your walk with God that shows with your animals. Now, some people love an animal who is a one-person animal. They don't want nobody else. I think that ruins that animal. Because that animal should be a friend to everybody like this Doberman, Doberman was, except for someone who is out to do me harm. And instinctively, there was only one person she wouldn't let near me. Outside of that, there were hundreds. She would, oh, she would bite her tail and she, oh, she just loved people. And she was, oh, she was a beautiful Doberman. But anyway, I can understand why God would say the crouching. If you know anything about animals, and we trained horses, we trained, uh, we tra trained uh, animals, you, you would know submission is very important. 
But now we'll go back to the days of Noah. He said they will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Well, you know, <laughs> marrying and giving in marriage, <clears throat> excuse me, nowadays, and people may not understand my thinking on this, but I know it to be true. Even though God says, obey the law, all right, you can obey God's law and get married by someone who is holy, who is a preacher. Uh, you can write up a contract. You could date it, write down your vows and have a certificate before God of marriage. Rather than take one by the government that says that it's okay to, it, 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 the certificate blesses the same sex marriage, men with men and women with women. You automatically, when you submit to that, you submit to a curse over your marriage. And then you wonder why you have trouble. You wonder why so many things go wrong. Some people, they knowingly marry into families that they know have some severe problems. In my time, I had no idea. I had no idea that three members of the family were Masons. I didn't even know what a Mason was. And I kept on praying because there was so much trouble in my marriage, I, I couldn't understand what was going on. And even though my husband was an Mason, it still affected our marriage. And because I didn't know God, I didn't understand how to break curses. I didn't understand how to stop this warlock and witch's work and, and how these evil things happen. And, <clears throat> and so we went through many years of going through things until I discovered the things of God and discovered how to overcome and break these curses. I think at one time, every time I went and prayed about something, God would show me the word men. He said, men have done this to you. You need to break the power of men over you. And and I'm sitting there thinking, but who do I know that would do such a thing that would cause me all this trouble in the spirit? <clears throat> well, I found out years later, it was Mason's. Because Masons, <clears throat> they gather together in secret and they swear against you. They curse you. And many people go into it thinking that that's Christian. The biggest clue is a secret organization where you tell nobody. You swear that you can tell nobody. That is a big clue. You're in trouble with God. That's a big clue that whatever's up the road is satanic. It's not God. Because Jesus Christ said, don't swear by anything. And yet these people, they gradually and slowly introduce you to evil. They come looking like, the, and oh, they, oh, they believe. Many of them in the beginning believe they're Christians. And even though you go and you are promoted in chairs, no one knows who sits in that last chair. And you don't find out till you get there that it's Satan. And so all the while you're doing this, you're doing things if you've read the Bible, if you ever went to church and understood anything about Jesus Christ, you would know that you're going against everything in that Bible. And you cannot blame everybody. You have to accept you did this. So you're trapped. You are trapped with those curses that are so powerful and on some people. And I've said it to you before. I've seen people where uh, they say, if I ever divulge this, may... Uh, my children die this way or that. And it happened. It happened. When they tried to get out of it, those curses had to be broken. But you see, there's a lot of people that suffer more fear, fear of Satan than they do of God. 
more fear of the backlash. Oh, my, I used to see it with so many preachers. They didn't want to touch this because there's a backlash to it. Oh, the enemy will come after you if you touch his territory. Oh, you can't touch abortion because ab abortion is a territory of evil that God has put in place. And it was God himself that did it. So you're going against God. <laughs> no, my friend. Oh, no, my friend. Jesus Christ said in certain places in that Bible that he died to destroy the works of Satan. That he wants you to resist the devil that he may flee. That he wants you to stand up to him. I mean, when the enemy would come to me, even in the face of death, for some reason God gave me such a powerful grace that I just laugh. I'd laugh right in his face. Oh, I could feel the power. I could feel everything he was trying to do to me. And believe you me, I don't think some of you could have lived through it. But there the Lord had me in the name of Jesus laughing. When he said, I'm going to, <laughs> I said, oh, no, you will not. And some of you are so foolish that you actually think that you could deliver me up to Satan. Oh, my goodness. Because I don't think like you. I don't feel like you. I don't do what you do. I don't say what you do. Even Jesus said, leave him alone. If they're talking about me and doing a good work with me, they, knowing in my name, they, they cannot do anything bad or wrong. Leave them alone. Because the disciples complain, well, they're not of us. So what? What business is that of yours? If souls are being saved and healed and delivered, then why would you care? This is why I said, Paul the Apostle said, one preaches Christ of contention, another one preaches a, uh, Christ this way. But I rejoice because Christ is being preached. So you don't go out and, and pick on this one or that one, but you do stand up and rebuke and exhort when it comes to deliberate sin, deliberate defiance. Because we're not talking about serving God your way, in a sense, your tradition, your ritual, your... We're not talking about that. We're talking about claiming God and doing evil. And doing evil that good may come for you. Because you don't care about anybody else. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the people that have blasphemed God's name. And possibly some have blasphemed his spirit. It just depends. And I guarantee you, if you blaspheme God's spirit, there is something that would come upon you that you wouldn't have no care if you lived or died or anybody else did. You would be capable of the worst things because you just don't care anymore. You see, God made our spirits to always want to be with him. God made us in such a way that we would always want to please him and do his will. He made us in such a way that we are spiritual beings. First, spiritual beings that we would search out the spiritual. That's why many people start out. And the first place they go into is cults. Cults are places that say, if you don't do it my way, you don't have God. If you don't follow this doctrine, you don't have God. There's only one doctrine, and it's written in the epistle of John. Jesus has come in the flesh, and anybody, I don't care who you are, can receive Jesus on their knees. They don't have to do it before everybody. And you say, well, it says you're supposed to confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart and thou shalt be saved. You can do that right before God. You can confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say you had to do it 
to a whole church. He didn't say that you had to have a witness. Even Jesus was accused of saying and doing the wrong thing because he says, you testify of yourself, so your testimony is not true. I mean, they dared to say this to Jesus. So they say to you today, well, you talk about yourself and give testimonies about yourself with God, so your testimony is not true. That's a lie. Paul the Apostle <laughs> stood there and says, I speak in tongues more than you are. I've been through shipwrecks. I've been through this. I went, I, 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 I. I went here, I did that, I, 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 because he could not separate himself. He could not separate the word I from what him and God pulled him through. He couldn't do that. So you, you sit there and you say, well, you, you use the word I, so your testimony isn't true. Well, you live like a demon. You do evil to people. And yet you go, well, you're, you're, see, you're not of God because you did this. <laughs> no difference between you and others. There are people who actually hate themselves so bad that they will torture and torment you so that they can trouble you and tempt you to fall. And once you fall into fighting with them or arguing with them, then they say, now I got them. See that? They're no Christian. They're just like me. And that means I can do anything because I don't see any example of any Christianity. And if you're foolish, you fall into their traps. And you fall into their trap daily and over and over and over. You get emotionally upset. You get hurt feelings. You don't take the persecution the way you're supposed to take it. You don't believe that you're supposed to suffer when the first thing you're supposed to do is suffer. So you fight. And I, I just said this to a couple today because they were asking me what is, uh, what is a reprobate sin? Well, that's where God gives you up to sin. You want to sin? God says, have at it. Go get it. You want that sin so bad? He lets you go. He says when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and their foolish hearts were darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and he gave them over to Vile affections, men with men and women with women. But more than that, he said, and this is the part everybody ignores. Every preacher that I've ever heard preach, I never heard them preach on this because most of them do these things. Being filled with all unrighteousness, unmerciful. There are preachers that are unmerciful. Like I've seen somebody who is so ignorant, knows nothing, can't even function. And they'll go to the altar and a preacher will stand there and laugh at them and call them stupid. And make a fool out of them in front of everybody. Instead of embracing them in prayer to rebuke that stupid spirit and ask God for a healing so that they can be usable to God. I've seen the opposite there. They're lifted so high. Hey, they've got tremendous wisdom. So they cut off this one and they cut off that one. They don't work with them to make them better. They allow people to work with them and they call it protocol. They call it the protocol they go through. You have to pass through this protocol in order for you to serve in this ministry. So you think that you pick out the best, and there's so many foolish people will run after you. And the shame of it all is, is you actually believe what you're doing is right. The sad part about it is, is God called you. That's the sad part. I'm not talking about people who don't have God. I'm talking about people who have walked and talked with him on certain things.
where he took them and he gifted them. But you see, they didn't clean out the inside of the cup. They didn't clean out the mind and the heart. They didn't take every thought captive. They didn't labor to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. So they couldn't tell you how to do it. They can't explain to you how to do it because they don't know how to do it. All they know is they picked up the Bible or they picked up a book and they read what uh, a famous preacher did and how he overcame. And that's what they patterned their life after. But the suffering of Jesus Christ, of picking up your cross and following after him, is the thing that they rejected. If they did not reject the suffering of Christ in your life that you need to go through, you actually need to walk the path that Jesus walked by picking up your cross and following him. And you need that, but they don't want the parts of that. So they will preach and teach, well, if you're not blessed, you don't have God. Because the proof that you have God is you're blessed, and that's totally untrue. Well, if you don't, if you don't prosper, you don't have God. That's untrue. Because there are many things that you pass through to build up your strength and character in Christ Jesus. And it can only happen through long suffering and endurance. And many people will not pay attention. They will not listen to that. Like I said, they want to jump over the process. And now more than ever before, America has sat so powerfully strong. Everything instant satisfaction. Everything even to their children in electronics and everything, having everything instant satisfaction. And now they're coming to a place that that's almost gone. They're coming to a place now that people are coming and taking over. And they sit there and cry and wonder why. Why, I'm your child. I'm a Christian. Why would I go through this? Because you didn't go through it back there. When he first called you, you were supposed to make your call election sure. You were supposed to die to self and pick up your cross. Oh, you died to self when it came to making your ministry a business. You died to self when it came to getting the satisfaction of doing whatever you wanted and having preeminence over people. Oh, you oh, you died. You paid a big price for that. But you never died to your flesh, to its desires. Like I said, inside of all of us is a desire to be with God. Everybody thinks the worst thing that could happen to a Christian is for them to go to hell. That isn't the worst. The worst thing that could happen to them is for all eternity to be without God. If I had not experienced all the things he was telling me about and teaching me in the word, if he taught me about outer darkness, he taught me and revealed to me what it showed like, what it felt like in the spirit. If he taught me about Ananias and Sapphira fallen down dead, being consumed by the living God, I felt that I went through it. See, he, he was teaching me. He taught me about the everything so that I could come and tell it to you. And then he took me into all of his glory and showed me that there is nothing in heaven, on earth, anywhere that could ever compare with the fear and the terror of being in his presence. Because you would know with all of your heart you should be dead. That is why so many people, and they laugh, they laugh at the people that fall under the power. They forget what it says in the word when the uh, when the soldiers came to get Jesus. What did it say? They fell backwards. 
Why? Because flesh cannot stand in the presence of the Spirit. So when you fall under the power and you feel the power of God come on you and you fall under the power, and like I said, your your head will hit cement just like that, and it'll bounce, and you won't feel a thing. It'll be like hitting a cushion. So, so many of these, these things, they need to be taught, they need to be heard, they need to be understood. And I don't know who's doing it because I do not listen to others. I don't go into your life and nib in what you are doing. That is your business between you and God. Oh, uh, God will say, Marion. Listen to this. I want you to know that this is what someone is doing, and I want you to pray because many are being deceived, and they're my children. Now, that I can do. That I know. That I understand. But to follow after you and listen to you all day long and watch over everything you say so that I can expose you to millions of people and say, oh, well, you know, they're going to hell. See this scripture? It's a, those people that do that kind of thing are headed for hell themselves. They are in the wrong pew because that is not what God is about. Because some of the people that you're playing with are innocent. I guarantee you some of them are wrong. Some of them are false prophets. But some of them don't know yet. Some of them never learned what you know. And they're innocent because you were never held responsible for what you don't know. You are only held responsible for what you do know. And what you do know is not to do what you're doing. And you can't tell God anything. If you ever stood between uh, in the presence of God, there's not a thought that can pass through your brain that he doesn't have control of. There's not a feeling or emotion or anywhere inside of you, anywhere, that he doesn't have absolute power over. And you can't lie to him. If your very being and what you have done to yourself lies to him, like I'm saying, you're going to stand before him if you were born a man, you're going to stand before him no matter how you powder up, no matter how many operations you have, no matter how many hormones you take. You are going to stand before him as what he created his creation. You're going to stand before him as a man and answer the first thing is what you did to your body. Oh, you won't have a conversation. One look from him. And I'm telling you, you won't be able to bear it. You will not be able to stand in his presence. Just one second. The same if you're a woman. I don't care how much you want to be a man, how hard you strive, and all the hormones you take. I don't care if you have 10 mastectomies. I don't care if you cut the genitals off. I don't care what you do. You're going to stand before God the way you were born the way you were created at conception because you see when that sperm gets fertilized with that egg that is conception that is where life begins that is where you're conceived that's why they call it conceived that is where everything happens to make a man or a woman and those that have lied and told you that there is more than one to pamper you, to use you so that they can use your vote, use your whatever, and you listen to them. And the predators that prey, prey on little children in talking to them about such things, all of you are so ignorant. Read, read. Read Romans chapter 1, then go into Romans chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, because you not only do the same things 
but you have pleasure in them that do do it, knowing they are worthy of death. And you think you're going to escape? No, my friend. No, you're not. When you, you know, when you watch Will and Grace, and you just totally just love them, you're half finding pleasure in them that do it. When you watch something on on uh, on a movie where you see two people that aren't even ma married and they're laying in bed fornicating because if you do it in your mind, you've already done it, the Lord says, and you have a wholesome, healthy in your mind threesome with them, you might as well be right there in that bed with them because the voyeurism, the living through them, you're enjoying every bit of it. You have pleasure in them that do it. You have pleasure in the pornography. It only lasts. It's soft porn. You can tell when you see any one of these movies, you know instantly, for God has showed it to you, you know instantly what's up the road. You know there's certain words and certain things that trigger that you know what's coming. And yet you still stay there and say, well, I'm going to zap it. In the end, at the last second, I'm going to enjoy this movie up to, and then I'm going to zap it. Well, that doesn't erase where you went. That doesn't erase where you went here, here, and here. That is not repentance erases it. The blood of Jesus Christ in repentance releases, erases it. That's the only thing that can erase it is the blood of Jesus Christ. But you think you're playing and fooling God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, I had said before about fasting and praying, okay? One gives up coffee, another one gives up candy. I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't fast that way. I believe that is why my prayers are far more powerful and I don't have to fast for, uh, days and days. My fasting is a separation from everything in this world. Uh, everything connected to the flesh, I'd live without. Joyfully, happily, and filled with love. I don't have to satisfy my flesh by my eyes laying on this to have pleasure and going over there to have pleasure. I don't have to do that. Because you see, it's written in Romans. You are not any longer a slave to sin. You belong to whoever you yield your members to. So if you say, I love God and I belong to Jesus and you yield to lust, you yield to evil, you yield in any way, you're, you know, who are you fooling? You're not fooling God. He says, resist the devil and he will flee. Resist those feelings. He tells you plainly what temptation does. He tells you in James exactly what tempts you, the lust of your own heart. How is the condemnation about the lust of your own heart? How is that condemning to you? You're a human, and all men have that. All women have that. So you're tempted by what's in your heart. That's not something you go down with. That is something that you overcome. That is something that you say, well, I'm not going there anymore because God just revealed to me that's wrong. Many will say to you, well, you should follow the life of Christ and live like Jesus did. Oh, really? Do you know how he lives when you're watching certain things you shouldn't be watching? 
when you're playing and toying with things in your mind that you shouldn't be doing, when you are exalting and making idols about the things that you have pleasure in, and that's all you think about until you're ready to preach on a Sunday. So then you pick up the word, but after living and doing what you want to all week. Now, I'm not saying all of you, some of you, and I'm so, oh my goodness, I've seen some of you that can preach hellfire and brimstone and beat your wives. I've seen some of you that can fool every single person that's around you that comes in contact with you because they, their eyes are blind. They are looking for an idol to worship. They have never gotten on their knees for God. They want to play in the spirit. They want to play church. They want to pretend. They want to live in La La Land. It's easier than doing what you need to do. So like the days of Noah, this is the things they were doing. And the saddest part about it was, is the dark angels, the things that they did was so vile. The influence they had over mankind is the very influence they have today, where they were drinking blood, you know, where they were eating flesh, human flesh. There are people who get uh, actually get a transfusion of adrenaline, which is the blood from babies, and they think they're going to live forever. They, oh, some of them are really old, and they can do that, and they really think it keeps them young, but it doesn't stop them from growing ugly. It doesn't, ugly is ugly. Ugly from the inside out is so vile. Oh, you can paint yourself up for one night. You can put all kinds of shots in your body, like, but, I, I forget what they call it. But you can do all those things for one time, one night. You can be shot up with drugs that make you feel good on that day, and then it wears off. And as it wears off, dementia comes back, lies come back, Evil comes back. And I don't know if you've noticed, but things that we have seen, even on the news, that these people have said, and they did it, and when they were confronted with it, I never did that. I never said that. Why? Because up here is going, and you can't stop it. Now, there's, there's one guy that wears a rag on his head, and that he has cancer. He doesn't understand. When he fights for evil. And defends evil. And he knows it's evil. Every man knows. When things are evil. And when he does that. He has no idea. There are worse things than cancer. No idea. I've had cancer. I've had cancer to the point where they said I, I was not going to live. So I know, I know exactly what that feels like at the point of death because my spirit left my body three times. So I know, and I've gone through other things, but there are worse things than even that. That when you set yourself up against God and you stand in his way and you defend people who are torturing little children in slave trade, who are literally using them as sex trade, sex trading them, who are, when you stand up for that and you think that you take all of your talents and you manipulate, abracadabra, you manipulate and intimidate and you think because your mouth can gainsay, you're not the only one. There's so many of you. So like the one that sits down and, and she's putting on makeup and she thinks that every man is after her, lusting after her. She doesn't even see or know that she has a very big, flatter nose. Oh, she paints up her eyes the way Jezebel did. She puts all of her makeup on and she thinks she's absolutely beautiful. 
She lives in La La Land that everybody lusts after her. She lives in a place where she's so foolish, she does not know she can lose all of that in one second. One second. When you hurt other people and destroy, especially children, when you are out working daily to use the poor, to destroy, and you're, and you're out there pretending you're something you're not. You're not playing with man. You are playing with God. You people that cannot see God and do not know God, who lie and say that you do, you have a time where God says he's going to come upon you like a thief in the night. I remember a man who had just troubled somebody and troubled them and troubled them. And no matter what you said, no matter what you did, he would not repent of it. And I remember the word of God coming to me and telling me, I can change this in one second. And by the time I got up and walked to another room, it was changed. In that second, that person was in so much pain, they were dying. One second. One second. This one that claims she's unstoppable, nobody is going to stop her from doing what she wants. Who cares about the many Christian children who have been mutilated, maimed, lied to, destroyed? Who cares about that? God does. Who cares about the grandmother who served God all her life and sees that happen to her grandbaby? Who cares about the mother that they took her baby off of her because she would not agree with this garbage? Who cares about that father that knows his daughter was raped and they locked him up because he protested about it? Who cares? Why, you can get away with all of these things. There is no God. Oh, my friend, there is a time to repent because you're going to be one of the ones that is going to beg, beg to get in. You're going to beg God not to let the things that you did come upon you. Not to let the people, to let you hurt the way you hurt people. You're just going to beg. And you know what's going to happen to you according to the word? He will not hear you. It's written in Psalm 18, I will have mercy on those who have mercy. And when you can pray on little ones in the schoolroom, and have no mercy on what you're doing, shooting up them up with hormones, operating on them, taking them away from their parents. When you can do that, you're a predator. You're an evil person that needs to repent. You have no mercy. And you lie. The invasion that is coming is like a war. When you're in war, you cannot allow... People in your borders, you have to stop them. You have to defend your own family first. You have to defend your own children first. Because if you're so dumb that you think that God wants you, your children replaced and you have nothing, after he blessed you with everything, and you're so dumb that you take it, you don't stand there, you cry. You know why? Because many of you voted that in. You are reaping what you sow. That's why. You gave them that power and ability to do that to your life. Now you're out on the street. You don't have a home. You don't have a car. You don't have anything. Repent. Turn towards God and ask him to forgive you that you will stop listening to the propaganda that tells you that it is a cult to believe that you want to see these things change in America. Why do you think so many black people are changing? They should have changed a long time ago, but God is so merciful. 